All right, again, I'm, uh, I'm going to say uh, open with a couple of words here, uh, introductory words about the, the design guidelines project of the MWA. Um, it's, I think, one of the more, we do a lot of, I think, uh, important work, accomplished a lot in our seven years history as an independent organization. But I think this, this project has one of the most profound uh, potential to uh, really change, knit everything together and change. Those, we, we, who, came, who came here on a subway today or uh, took a bus or something? All right. Who turned on a light bulb to light the light a room or anybody turned on any electricity today, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? There's two utilities that take care of those two important functions. For, the, for our buses and subways, we have the MTA, right? We depend on them for transportation. Shh. For lights, we have Con Edison. Now, we also all depend on this, this waterfront for a lot of things, for education, for transportation, in times of uh, dynamic uh, horribleness like Sandy to protect us. It's a utility. But the difference between that utility and the other utilities I just talked about is that not one person or one entity controls it. It's controlled by hundreds, perhaps thousands of different uh, government groups, park administrators, private owners, developers. Uh, governmental entities. So what design guidelines, which you're going to hear about today, really for the first time, this is the first time we're, we're going to talk about it publicly to a large group, is a way of communicating to those stakeholders that you have a piece of utility that must be uh, used in a way that's beneficial, that provides resilience, that provides access, <coughs> that can be ecologically beneficial to all of us. So what it's it, think of LEED uh, as, as, a way, as a very inventive and wonderful way that we've been able to uh, incentivize folks to make more energy efficient buildings. That's what we want to do for uh, uh, the, the waterfront and design guidelines. We want community groups to be able to say, we want, we call it wedge, wet waterfront edge design guidelines. We want a community group to say to a uh, developer, Mr. Developer, how about a wedge uh, designation for your, de for your development? Or a park administrator, how about making our park a wedge park? That's the idea here, and this is the launching pad. We need your help, and I'm, I'm excited to, to hand it over to my colleague, Mike Porter, who's the, the project director on this project, to lead this uh, panel to, and hear why these folks love wedge, and they're going to tell you exactly why. Okay. Th thank you, Roland. Um, I'll say I love wedge. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Porto, Director of Outreach and Planning. Can you hear me? Testing, testing. All right. All right. I'm Michael Porto, Director of Outreach and Planning for MWA. Uh, I'm going to describe uh, waterfront, edge, waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, also known as WEDGE. Um, can you hear me? Yes. <coughs> okay. Um, thank you for choosing the wedge panel over the ferry panel. Um, <laughs> but I, as a consolation, I'll say that there's some projects up here that could possibly talk about ferries. And that really gets to the heart of what wedge is. Wedge is looking at the waterfront from a comprehensive point of view. So we have, um, I'll go through a little bit of a scorecard uh, to give you guys a sense of what wedge is about. And one of those things is promoting ferry service. And we know that sometimes you can't always build a ferry, and it's very site specific. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit. So um, I'm really uh, privileged to have this amazing panel. To my right is Joel Bergstein, president of Lincoln Equities, uh, building the Hallett's Point development. <coughs> uh, Regina Meyer to his right, president of Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, Andrew Winters uh, from Cornell Tech NYC. So those are our panelists, and we'd like to look at Wedge from a, <coughs> from a sort of realistic practitioner perspective. So they're going to give us a take for five to seven minutes about their projects and some of the innovative design features regarding public access and resiliency. Um, so we're really talking about Wedge as not a complete document, it's draft form, but these great panelists have done some, some cool things along the waterfront. We want to sort of showcase them and see how they can talk about them through a, through a Wedge prism. Uh, and then finally we have our uh, government representatives. <coughs> it really an all-star cast. We have uh, Venetia Lannan, uh, DEC Region 2 uh, Administrator. We have Michael Morella, DCP, um, <coughs> uh, Director of Waterfront and Open Space Planning, not as long as Joseph's title, Deputy District Engineer, Chief Programs and Project Management Division, U.S. Army Corps. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. 
Um, I'm just going to point to two documents that we've left on your chair if you don't have them. Uh, they'll be on the website. Hopefully you'll research Wedge after this amazing panel. <coughs> um, for the, f the first one is actually the nice, sexy blue one. This is our guiding principles and a fact sheet about Wedge. So I won't go through it in major detail, but we have identified guiding principles for waterfront edge design. And I won't go through every single one, but essentially um, we'd like to promote various things I think all of us can somewhat agree on. We have an all-star cast of people that are part of the Wedge team, and that includes the regulatory framework, Army Corps, <laughs> uh, DCP, uh, DEC. We really can't do this in a vacuum, so I'd like to sort of impress on everyone that we, we kicked this off a few months ago, um, and we have an all-star cast of people, including regulatory uh, entities, uh, practitioners, users, um, and then, of course, um, our, our stakeholders um, <coughs> and designers and practitioners. So we actually have landscape architects, marine biologists, a whole variety of entities that are sort of helping us do this because I, I certainly can't do it alone and, and won't pretend to. So uh, the other document I'll go through real quickly is just a, a draft uh, seven categories. <coughs> so like LEAD, we have various categories to represent what we're trying to do. Uh, and I should note that we are starting with residential commercial. Um, we have a grandiose sort of scope of looking at residential commercial uses, uh, parks and natural areas, and industrial maritime. So I'll, I'll be quite busy, and, and to be honest, this is about showcasing Wedge today, but also gathering your feedback. We're going to hand out um, index cards for questions and answers, and we hopefully can, can uh, tackle that after the respondents. Uh, but I w would also say contact me if you have any questions and you'd like to be part of our team. And I see some, see some people here that are actually part of Wedge, and, and I, I give a debt of gratitude, including Studio V, Jay Volgara, who's actually the architect for Joel Bergstein, uh, Hallett's Point. <coughs> so thank you, Jay. Um, so I'm going to go through the document. Uh, the title is Wedge Residential Commercial Categories um, at the top. So what we're trying to do is incentivize better edge design. We've identified seven categories, and this is very much in draft form, but I think we're comfortable showing everybody here. <coughs> so just to kick it off, uh, site selection and planning, any good incentive program has sort of a threshold gateway to enter into the program. So this is real quickly talking about responsible development, project siting, uh, various sort of planning-oriented things you can do with the site, possibly before you even get into design. So like LEAD, sort of getting points for sort of uh, siting near a ferry, uh, uh, facility, things like that. This also includes climate change analysis, sea level rise, and, and a flooding uh, assessment. Uh, what we're here mainly to talk about today is public access and interaction, and again, this is in draft form, but I draw your attention to the scorecard at the bottom, and we've identified um, some things to consider when you are or should be building for public access and interaction. Um, like any good incentive program, we have uh, prerequisites, which aren't too strict. We want people to enter the program. So if you look at the scorecard, maintain and provide public access. So do not take away required public access. Uh, prerequisite two, engage local community and users. Really getting the future users' feedback in what you build at the waterfront, possibly having a meeting or two about that process. So it's really a dialogue to, to find the best sort of um, user-friendly design going forward. So. Uh, edges, I'll just mention edges is really talking about where the water meets the land. Uh, we'd like to sort of address shoreline treatments, provide green and resilient design features as appropriate. Um, this is really getting into what do you have at the waterfront edge or what are you going to build. If you can soften the edge, uh, obviously that would be <coughs> more points. Um, maybe greening a bulkhead, things that you can really do to, to retrofit what you have in place. And then ecology and habitats is really talking about improving ecological values and enhancing the ecosystem of the site. So that's a little bit more in the water. And then really getting into um, important but maybe unsexy things, materials and resources, encouraging use of materials that may be flood and so salt water resistant, permeable, recycled, local, marine, and eco-friendly. <coughs> and then operations, maintenance, and monitoring. Of course, along the New York waterfront, New York and New Jersey waterfront, I should say, um, maintenance of our waterfront edge is, is obviously a big deal. We like to um, you know, identify sustained maintenance strategies and pot potential partnerships to advance scientific analysis of the edge. So we really like, someone mentioned in another panel, partnering with various academic institutions. Hopefully this will incentivize a bit of more scientific analysis of what we do at the edge. 
And again, I know I've said this a lot, and we're not copying lead by any means, but there is an innovation category, which is essentially admitting sometimes we don't know uh, what to put down at that time. So hopefully this is a living document that will live on, and we can hopefully um, spur new designs that we can sort of add to our manual um, as we move along. So uh, without further ado, um, just to give you a schedule, we are looking to um, have a draft version uh, 1.0 by September. So hopefully you'll follow our progress. Um, and now I'm actually going to give it over to Joel Bergstein. He's going to talk about his uh, development, how it's point, and how they might be um, sort of hearkening to wedge type designs for public access and also uh, possibly resiliency. So Joel, take it away. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. Hello. Is that better? All right. So um, Hallett's Point is the uh, only peninsula on the Queens waterfront. It, uh, it is just at Hell's Gate, which uh, we probably will pass uh, uh, later today, and directly uh, across the river from Gracie Mansion and Carl Schertz Park. It's a unique site uh, on the Queens waterfront in that, uh, aside from being a peninsula, it's a rather isolated site. Um, most of, in, in the early part of, of the last century, um, there were, there were um, uh, actually residential homes that were there, uh, and then it, it, tra it, tra it, it transcended itself, it transferred itself to, into uh, industrial use. Uh, in the 50s, um, there was a large New York City Housing Authority uh, development site that was built there, and it really was not part of the community, nor was there any really any waterfront access uh, for the community that was there. There was a promenade that, that uh, uh, NYCHA built, uh, but it really connected uh, to nowhere. So when we approached the site, one of the things that we felt was important was how do we connect not only the immediate community, but how do we connect the rest of the Astoria community? And we're about a, a little bit uh, less than a mile away from Astoria Park. Uh, to the waterfront. More into the mic. Okay. Um, how do we how do we connect more to th the rest of the community? How do we connect to Astoria Park? And in the design that we developed along with 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 um, with Jay, we looked at the site and we had an opportunity really to build two blocks. They measured just about the same distance, but we felt that by really creating what would be two traditional blocks that it wouldn't be inviting enough both to the local community and the greater community. So what we did is we created more upland connections. Um, two more, actually, uh, one, two, two more than we, than we were required by city planning in order to do, which gave us a much more open feeling and we created a plaza. The, the waterfront guidelines at the time required a 40-foot promenade. There were percentages of open space to, uh, to building and we actually exceeded that, again, looking to create an environment which would connect along the greenway of the Queens waterfront, paying homage to the waterfront and the history of the site and the site itself. We had always anticipated that we would need to be sensitive to the fact that there, there might be a storm. We never anticipated Sandy, but our guidelines, um, and we had actually elevated the site uh, in our original design. Post Sandy, the site actually wasn't very, uh, uh, was, was only marginally impacted uh, by the storm, and there was very little water that came onto the site. Um, but the new FEMA maps dictated that we had to raise that elevation another six feet, which we went back to the drawing boards, and we had to come up with a solution. We could deal with what the promenade and the boardwalk uh, would be like, and we chose a boardwalk rather than having a, a, a concrete walkway. And it was permeable, and it was uh, uh, it was green from a, a, a point of view that it was wood versus versus. Um, and we may use recycled wood. We're not sure what we're going to do there uh, in terms of materials. But what was important was how do you got how did you create the access from the street onto the site? Because now all of a sudden, I think we're 11 feet um, um, above the grade. And so the the transition there really is almost Soho-ish. So if you've walked the streets of Soho, it's not unusual that you have steps that you have to walk up, but then you needed to be handicap accessible. So we created a, a, a very interesting series of steps and, and ramps that integrated together so that uh, people could use the Let rampways. Is your cat. Yeah. Okay. okay. So where I left you was this uh, step and ramp system. 
Um, when we when we looked at the waterfront edge, we we had both a hard surfaces as well as soft surfaces. Um, with the board in, again integrating the boardwalk in into the promenade, and and that gave us uh, uh, an opportunity to bring people closer to to the waterfront. So the net of this really was a, 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 what we believe is a well thought out design that was initially sensitive to to um, uh, the storm potential, but became further sensitized post Sandy. Um, that has a, a very green component and is an inviting opportunity not only for the local residents, the residents of the new development, but for the overall community. The park that we're creating will be lined with restaurants. Uh, there'll be uh, only uh, really service retail there, but the real opportunity is to bring uh, people from the rest of, of, of Astoria closer to the waterfront, giving them dining options as well as a wonderful, a wonderful promenade. Thanks, Joel. Uh, if I could just add as the moderator, um, I didn't go into detail on the scorecard, but Joel mentioned exceeding zoning zoning requirements, which uh, is actually a good thing in this case. You know, adding uh, more space to the public shore walkway, um, increasing upland connections. These are the things we are trying to do. And for instance, Joel and his development would get um, points for subcategory B, which is increased linkages and green space. So I'll just sort of chime in as you guys talk uh, about your project. Uh, Regina, take it away. Sure. Um, good afternoon, and thank you to the MWA for having for having me and being on a great panel of my peers. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with nearly everyone here, so it's um, great to be um, as a par part of this. Um, I think many of you know Brooklyn Bridge Park is a, a, par a new park on the Brooklyn waterfront. It's about a mile and a third. Um, stretching from just north of the Manhattan Bridge on the Brooklyn side south to Atlantic Avenue and since 2010 we've been um, opening the park up in fa on a phased basis um, our park is largely funded by um, city capital funds at this point and we've been able to phase the project and bring significant parts of it uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, significant new new waterfront spaces. I'm um, just gonna. Uh, I'm just gonna. I think. I just. I th you got to hold the mic right up to your mouth, and uh, you guys can't see the people in the back that are making very quizzical faces. Okay. Okay. okay <laughs> like, what are you saying? Yeah, okay. So I wanted to talk about how the wedge program um, um, uh, is relevant to Brooklyn Bridge Park, and um, happily, this is a conversation that. Um, the design uh, we've been having at Brooklyn Bridge Park with the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance for a few years now, um, and that really is talking about the evolution of edge design um, throughout New York City and how Brooklyn Bridge Park has has evolved based on um, um, some of the concepts that are in wedge. Um, of course, when you think about the pro uh, the the uh, standard New York City waterfront park, and you think about Riverside Park or Battery Park City, you're thinking about a lot of bulkheaded edges and really beautiful lights and benches along the waterfront in, in a beautiful necklace. And I think what um, um, MWA is doing now with uh, the wedge uh, format is really thinking about what is the next generation of, of, site, um, of site design. And um, Brooklyn Bridge Park has, has been thinking about that as well. Um, a lot of our design, of course, addressed a post-industrial site. We, we had a site that was largely used by, um, for, by the Port Authority for warehousing and shipping, but then was in disrepair, and there was a lot of um, bulkheaded conditions that were in grave need of repair. Um, also, the, our design, which, as, as many of you know, is um, all um, created by Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates as both the lead planner and lead designer, um, we wanted to address what we knew was coming in terms of sea level rise. And so um, the use of topography and the use of salt resistant plants were always a part of our plan um, from, from the earliest stages in the um, 2002. Um, but I do want to uh, address closely some, the three major aspects of Wedge that I think our design um, really does point out. Um, the first one would be what we call at Brooklyn Bridge Park structural economy. And that, what that meant to us when we were designing Brooklyn Bridge Park and now building it was to closely align the design of the park to the engineering um, ability on the site. 
And for us, what did that mean? That meant that we probably could never rebuild any of the Port Authority bulkheads. Um, they were just simply way too expensive for our park budget. And honestly, they weren't the ethos that we wanted in terms of a design. And so what that meant, and you can see it all in the images that I've passed out in it, and in Michael's images, was is that many, many areas where there were um, bulkhead and significantly bad repair have been replaced with both riprap or beaches. And those soft edges are exactly what proved to be very resilient during um, the storms, but it has also proved um, to be one of these soft edges that really engages the public in another level of, um, des and of design on our site. Um, we've just recently created our second beach um, at the park. The first beach, of course, was built by the Parks Department at, up at Main Street, um, but we've just built a brand new beach at um, B Pier F Louder, yeah. Louder, at Pier 4, um, which again will promote um, a, another soft edge um, where you could get directly into the water. I'd say the second element is um, that the, um, so the wedged um, design mode um, highlights for Brooklyn Bridge Park is highlighting the natural environment in the harbor. And there's been a lot of different ways that we've done that, um, but I think the two most uh, significant are rebuilding the natural environment in an industrial site has meant such things as building salt marshes. And we've already done that twice at the park, once at Pier 1 and once at Pier 5. And bringing that natural edge to the waterfront has added a whole nother layer of, of design and enhancement to the, to the waterfront. Um, we've also reused a, a tremendous amount of material at the park. Um, I think most um, uh, uh, aligned with the wedge theory is the a tremendous reuse of uh, granite at our park. We've reused granite from both the Willis Avenue um, Bridge and the Roosevelt Island Bridge in tremendous, uh, to a tremendous success in, in a number of our design features. And I think lastly, um, I want to talk about the community. Um, the community um, really wanted to get down to the water at Brooklyn Bridge Park. That was really one of their major goals. And we've done that by building um, um, docks to use for boating. And I'm sitting here just with Dottie Ledendowski, who is, has guided our, our program, and, and what we also call get downs. And so there's a number of places in our park where you can walk directly to the water, touch the water, throw a stone in the water. Um, that really differentiates our park from sort of the standard Riverside Park model. Um, so those are the ways that I think Brooklyn Bridge Park can uh, address this program. Thanks. Thank you, Regina. Um, there is a, a joke around the office that will give you a retroactive wedge award. We'll see. Oh, thank so. you. <laughs> and as you know, these are developments. Um, we actually had David Lombino here, or we were expecting him, uh, so he canceled because of a hearing, which is probably the only excuse to actually get his development uh, approved. So um, I should say thank you to Two Trees for sponsoring. Uh, next, we have Andrew Winters of uh, Cornell Tech. <clears throat> and Wedge is really, uh, of course, talking about the waterfront edge. And I think Andrew, uh, his site defines a waterfront site, but I should say that Wedge isn't necessarily um, appropriate as far as, you know, uh, rethinking his edge, because he can't. And Rioc, uh owns it. So maybe, Andrew, you could talk a little about what you're doing, uh, maybe less public access and more resiliency. Hi, thank, thank you. Can you hear me? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do it this way. Can, can you hear me now? Is that better? OK. Again, thank you for inviting me. I'm Andrew Winters. I'm with Cornell Tech. We're a relatively new institution in New York City as we grow. But thank you for the invitation. And we look forward to participating in the civic community as we move forward. Uh, so as was mentioned, our site is a little bit of an outlier when it comes to thinking about the edge. Because we don't actually control the edges of the, of, of the site around Cornell Tech. We're located on Roosevelt Island, and we're located at the southern end of Roosevelt Island. And really, the site itself was one of the major factors that led Cornell to select this location of all the ones that were offered within the New York City area. And one of the ideas of the design is to really take advantage as much as possible of the waterfront site. And of course, as everyone here knows, the waterfront sites include both positive advantages and there are, there are some challenges as well. So let me talk about the challenges first. 
in terms of the site itself, we are fairly low in the, in the floodplain area and we don't control the edges. So in order to deal with issues about rising water levels and potential storms, we had to take on that challenge ourselves on the site itself. We have a 12 and a half acre site and what we decided to do, uh, similar to what you've heard about before, is to raise the level of the site by approximately 10 feet. And we're choosing to do it in a fairly environmentally friendly way. There's a hospital currently located on the site. We're demolishing that hospital and we're crushing up the, the, uh, the masonry from that hospital and using that as the, uh, as the fill to raise the level of the site up. We're also doing it in a way where there are no retaining walls. We're creating a ridge at the center of our site. So the site really gently slopes up toward the center and all of the buildings open up onto that center ridge. We're creating a landscape with Jim Corner Associates field operations that is uh, uh, almost fully permeable, including all the paving. So while creating this ridge and creating this, this, this bermed landscape, we're not gonna be dumping a whole lot of water onto the roadway and then back into the river. So we're raising up the level of the site. We're opening all of the buildings onto that, that, that raised level. We're making sure that we have a pedestrian access way that is at the same level of, as, as all the entrances so we can avoid uh, uh, changes in level at the center of the campus. And the other thing we're doing with the design of the buildings is we're taking all of the building utilities and we're taking them out of the ground floor and we're putting them either on the first floor or more typically on the roof. And we're creating architectural solutions. One of the things that we're looking at on the campus is a very large solar panel canopy that sits on top of our academic building. And we're looking to use that as a screening device, not just to generate energy, but to be uh, at a civic scale and to create a screening device for a whole bunch of utilities that sit up on top of the building. In terms of the site itself and taking advantage of what we see, we're, we're a very unique site. We're about 800 feet wide. So not only do we have waterfront on the east side of the site, we have waterfront on the west side of the site. Terrific views that we want to take advantage of. In the short term, we've been working with the Roosevelt Island community to create a program for barging, to bring materials to and from the island for the, the construction, for the, for the demolition of the hospital, but also for the construction of the site. And we've committed to a program of about 40% uh, barging of all the materials that we're gonna be bringing to the site. And it's an interesting process, and in fact, I'm curious to hear what some people later on in this day talk about relative to industrial waterfront because the construction industry in New York is very focused on truck transportation and it's been uh, something of a steep learning curve to get working with contractors and others who are willing to uh, uh, work with the idea of a barging system to and from the island and so as we develop this campus over the next uh, 20 years we're really going to be looking to develop many of the buildings using these barging techniques and, and try to enhance the city's capability to use the waterfront, again, not just for residential and for recreational purposes, but for continuation of industrial and maritime purposes. And let me just mention two other quick things. Long term, we're looking at ferry service on the island. It's something that people have thought about for a long time on Roosevelt Island. We certainly think there's uh, a critical mass uh, now and with Cornell Tech there, there will be uh, an even greater critical mass. So we're, we're looking at, at working with that too. And finally, let me just say something about the academic mission of the university. It's a technology graduate program and we're focused on three particularly New York based hubs of inquiry. And one of them is the built environment. So on the campus itself, as we develop programs with uh, bringing professors and students to the island, we're gonna be looking uh, from a research and, and data perspective at the built environment using technology to enhance our, our thinking about the built environment and clearly with our waterfront site, uh, you know, I, I would certainly expect that, that waterfront development and thinking about the relationship between cities and their edges and water and development will be something that we'll be focused on from an academic perspective as well. Thank you. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, whose idea was to have a conference on a boat? Oh my God. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Venetia Lannan of DEC um, for a government, I wouldn't say a response, but maybe a perspective. As I mentioned, um, and you all know here, the maritime community and anyone doing anything along the waterfront will deal with DEC in New York State, of course. Uh, and then we have um, Michael Morella of DCP and Joe C. Bode of the Army Corps. So Venetia, take it away. Thanks. Again, this, I'm Venetia Lannan, Regional Director for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And uh, Roland gave each of us respondents an assignment, which was to say why I love Wedge. 
So I want to stay on. I want to stay on cue here. Um, I think uh, hopefully the picture, if you can hear the panel, is emerging that Edge is sort of, sort of like a lead, if a lead certification process for the waterfront, and they're you know we're developing it collectively with in, with developers and environmentalists and all the different stakeholders on the waterfront to say what do we want our waterfront to look like? What's good on the waterfront? What what do we want to encourage? And from the perspective of, the, of a regulator, what, why I love Wedge is because that gives the development community, um, and whether that's a park or a residential building or a tug operator, regulatory predictability, that, that this can help us signal to the industry, what do we want to see? What are the things that are important? Um, this has been a real focus of mine since I came to Region 2. Uh, the, the, the permits that we issue for most waterfront construction in the harbor are Article 25, Tidal Wetlands Permits. Um, over the past three years, we have cut our processing time in half for Article 25 permits, but we still have further to go. Um, one of the things that I stress that's very important to permitting staff is that you, you need to take a any pre-application meeting request that comes in, big or small, take that meeting because the guidance we can give an applicant early in the process is really key. Um, so having a, a set of design guidelines, again, it's, it, it, it helps us communicate what we're looking for. I'll give you um, an example of what we're looking for. So Roland referred to, yes, you, Roland. <laughs> Roland referred to the waterways as a utility, and they are. They're a really important utility. But um, they're also a uh, home. They're also a nursery to an astounding array of fish and wildlife. And um, the Hudson Raritan Estuary is an estuary of national significance. Um, no different than the Everglades or the Great Lakes. And a lot of people write this estuary off because it has been so polluted over time that they think, oh, what, I, even before I took this job, I'd look out at the Hudson and I look at it just as a, as a one-dimensional surface. There is a world under there. There are fish swimming under these piers right now that are huge. And I'll tell you about one of them, is the striped bass, the famous striped bass that brought down Westway. But the striped bass use these pile fields and um, smaller piers w over the winter season when it gets cold. They just hang out around here and hang out around these, around these piers. And this is where they spend an important part of their life cycle. So when, you're, um, when the Hudson River Park is looking to put in new piles, that's, that is habitat for those fish. Those fish rely on that sandy surface for important parts of their life cycle. So we need to protect it. But we also need to be cognizant there are a lot of other uses for the waterways. So um, I'll give you an example of where I think wedge can be useful when thinking about piles and pile design. And it's really something that we've been pioneering, or I should say Regina's been pioneering at Brooklyn Bridge Park. What is, a, what is an ecologically responsible pile look like? What are, its, what are its features? So we have historically focused on making them as skinny as possible so you're displacing less of that you know, sandy benthic habitat on the bottom, you're displacing less of the water column. But it's not just about narrowness. You know, uh, what about the, the materials it's, it's made of? We're working, Brooklyn Bridge Park has done a fantastic pilot project working with us to look at e-concrete, which is a, um, a product out of Israel that is a sort of a, a pH marine habitat friendly concrete that is nubbled to attract marine life to it. So it's actually habitat enhancing. Uh, we've also uh, looked at certain kinds of designs that minimize the sort of get skinny at the bottom but are a little bit fatter in the middle. Um, so they're structurally stable but they take less of that important habitat. So if we had a, de a wedge design guideline that says here's a, here's a pile design that we like, then we don't have to you know, say that in every single pre-application me meeting. We can say here engineers, designers, Look at look look at look at these things and 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 get some ideas. So that's that's kind of how I think um, wedge can. That's, that's why I love wedge. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Venetia, so much. Um, Michael. Hi. Hello and good afternoon. I'm Michael Morella. I'm the director of waterfront and open space planning at the New York City Department of City Planning. And before I begin, thank you for lowering that finally just for me. I appreciate that. Um, so before I begin uh, talking about my reflections on Wedge, let me first say a big thanks to the MWA 
for launching this, for, for Roland for having the courage to take this on, for Michael for leading this, and the, uh, the large task force that's working on this. Um, apparently I wasn't supposed to say that because the noise is starting again. Um, but special thanks to Jay Valgora and Studio V for, um, for um, spending so much time on this, and Jessica Fain from my team at City Planning um, for working closely with MWA as well. And the reason why I give thanks already, even though this is a work in progress, is because this is so incredibly difficult. Um, I don't think that there's a general appreciation for how difficult it is to come up with a set of design guidelines and coming up with numeric valuations on the various considerations. And there's an incredible amount of work that goes into synthesizing all of the various considerations that go into what goes on, what should be on the city's waterfront edge. And so I think um, those, the folks at MWA and everyone who's involved in this effort really deserves a lot of credit. Now, on to um, one of the reasons why I said it's so difficult is because um, we in the city have been thinking about this for a great number of years. In fact, when Venetia was working at EDC, she and I had many conversations about the need for design guidelines. And yet, despite our efforts and thinking about it, it was not something that we ever actually fully took on because we kept on running into this issue of exactly of the resources that would be required to actually take this on. Um, and so really special kudos to MWA. Um, from my perspective at the Department of City Planning, I see that there are really three main advantages to, this, to the wedge approach. Um, the first being that it very nicely complements waterfront zoning. As um, I'm assuming many folks in this room recognize, New York City has a very thick zoning resolution, um, some 3,000 pages, and contained within that, there's a section on waterfront zoning, which has special requirements for how you build along the waterfront. Um, and as presented thus far, Wedge nicely complements that. Um, Michael referenced earlier that, um, that you get extra points for exceeding zoning. Um, as a planner and as someone who works with zoning, I always get nervous when someone says the word exceeding zoning. Um, but this is one instance where exceeding zoning is actually a good thing insofar as it's taking the requirements of public access and expanding upon them. Um, so in the case of Hallett's Point, rather than building the, the prescribed um, connections, that they had wider connections to allow for a more generous public, public access to the waterfront, for example. I think that's one of the many examples that um, we're starting to see in, in Wedge that nicely complement zoning. Additionally, uh, in my role at the Department of City Planning, I also am the local administrator for our Coastal Zone Management Program, or the Waterfront Revitalization Program, as it's known locally here in New York City. And in that role, I work on the regulatory process with uh, Venetia and with Joe. And I think that Venetia very nicely explained how these wedge design guidelines are, have the capacity to significantly guide applicants through the regulatory review process um, with the objectives of significantly cutting down the amount of time that's required to go through that process. Um, I think that with all of our bold ambitions for the waterfront and the waterways, we have to recognize that a regulatory process that is burdensome is going to be a hindrance to seeing those projects we want on the waterfront. And I think Wedge could, is, a, is a step in that direction. And then finally, there's a third point, um, which is not in my formal official role as, as a planner at the Department of City Planning, but as a lover of the waterfront, and that more generally, that Wedge holds promise to really transform what we see along the water's edge, and that we can appreciate beyond regulation, beyond any formal controls, th that we will have a better waterfront if folks start building to the aspirations that we describe in Wedge. I think that's really important. That said, I think there are a couple of caveats that have to be considered going forward, um, and that is in details. Um, that Time, right now, Time's up. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, well played, sir. Just um, uh, is details, and it's incredibly difficult to um, describe in guidelines something like um, what is the appropriate boat tie-up. Um, that maritime operators have very specific requirements and that in order to be able to accomplish that, the wedge process needs to recognize the diversity of the uses, the diversity of the boats that are within our harbor and those boats that we want to attract to our harbor. And so working with maritime operators is really going to be critical to come up with a wedge, wedge for specifically for maritime 
tie-up, for instance, that really is able to accomplish that. Um, so more work ahead. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Joe Seaboat of uh, the US Army Corps, thanks. Thank you, and good afternoon. I fully agree with my two government colleagues to my left uh, on the value of wedge. Uh, I'm going to make two quick observations and then uh, talk through two points, and I'm, I'll wrap up telling you why I think wedge has value for us as a region. The first observation is that Sandy was a game changer. We had panels this morning where you heard about the impacts of Sandy, uh, and I think all of us, as we sit here, we can close our eyes and ask ourselves, what happened if that storm hit us on the same track and the wind speed was 30 or 40 miles an hour stronger? That is possible. We have had those storms in the past. So we can, we can think about a worse situation even than what we had 18 months ago. Uh, we can also close our eyes and think about our views on global climate change and the impacts that that would bring. A sea level rise potentially of up to three feet over, over the next century. These are significant impacts on our region. And so what they have caused and what we are doing is we are transitioning our waterfront to deal with these issues. And we are being very aggressive about it. Even our vocabulary has changed since 18 months ago. Since Sandy, we use words like vulnerability, susceptibility, fragility, resiliency, and sustainability. We all know what those words mean, and we've probably used them before Sandy, but now they're buzzwords for all of us. So how do we go forward and create a harbor and a region that reduces vulnerability, reduces fragility, reduces susceptibility, ensures that we have resiliency in our infrastructure and in our region, and is sustainable over the long term. You heard about the $60 billion emergency supplemental monies that are coming into the region and are being now executed through a variety of agencies. My agency alone is going to execute about $3 billion over the next seven years. We've already executed over $350 million of that money, and we have done most of the projects that are focused on repairing and restoring what was damaged from Sandy. But we are now moving into the next critical phase, the critical phase where we are going to start to spend money to start to build new projects to increase and improve our resiliency. And we want to do those projects in a way that complements all the other work that is going on in the region. So how do we do that? We want to be innovative. We want to be creative. We want to develop new strategies for resiliency. And you're going to hear terms like nature-based features, NBFs. We're going to be looking at natural shorelines. We're going to be looking at new technologies that are going to allow us to provide the levels of risk reduction that we think are important. And so complementing local efforts, complementing other government efforts, whether it be through a program like New York Rising or private investment, is going to be critical. And the wedge concept and the wedge approach is a great approach for making sure that we do it right. We need to collaborate and we need to create consistent approaches whereby we can ensure that one project being built upstream is not going to have an adverse impact downstream. There are opportunities here to build projects in a way that improves environmental sustainability and provides us the health and safety impacts and risk reduction that we're looking for, as well as the economic development needs. You heard a little bit about regulatory predictability. I also am a strong advocate for regulatory predictability. It is unfortunately a very difficult scenario when we are trying to bring projects through to the construction phase when there is inconsistent types of projects being presented that require significant 
research and where there are unknowns as to long-term impact. So creating a series of parameters for projects where we can actually then ensure that the permitting process will go quickly is the type of thing that I think will be a big benefit from Wedge. So like my colleagues, I support the Wedge, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to make this an important tool for our future as we go forward. Great, thank you. A round of applause to our panelists and respondents. It, it, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Um, we don't seem to have any. Question? Yeah. No, you can hand it to our volunteer. Sorry. We uh, we have about 20 minutes. I'll, I'll just take a few questions. Wow. Okay, I think um, this might be for Regina. Um, there's been a little bit of talk about historic ships in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Part of what Wedge is uh, incentivizing, of course, if you look at your sheet, is um, specific maritime docking amenities for infrastructure along the waterfront. So maybe this is how it's tied into Wedge. Um, this is, um, I, I imagine for Regina, how would um, Brooklyn Bridge Park um, include historic ships and, and provide facilities for, for docking and excursion ships to, to activate the waterfront. So. Oh, yeah. um, um, that's Maybe that talk about the marina? Sure, yeah. sure. We ha we're we're um, accommodating boating in, in three different ways at Brooklyn Bridge Park. One I already talked about in, uh, in terms of our community boating program. Um, we already have Brooklyn Bridge Boathouse working on um, on our eco dock and on our boat ramps, and that's a community-led program which provides free kayaking. Two other ways that we're accommodating boating at the park are um, this um, year we put into construction um, his, uh, mooring for historic boats and, and excursions at Pier 6, and that, that work has just gotten under construction this winter and we hope to have uh, available at Pier 6 um, those mooring facilities available. And then a third way is that we uh, also this year awarded a contract for um, a marina at Pier 5, and that marina will be a commercial mar marina which will also have a community boating component. So I think the three of those components really um, bring a lot of um, boat side use to Brooklyn Bridge Park. Okay, thanks Regina. Uh, the other question is, um, a bit of a statement, I think I, I, I'll give a simple answer. How will you incorporate solar and wind energy into Wedge? And as, as I mentioned, this is uh, you know, off to a good start, but there's no reason why we, we couldn't do that. We are not talking about buildings, however. You know, so um, we're really talking about the waterfront edge, a little bit upland, a little bit into the water. But different from LEED, we're not talking about individual buildings. So I think I have seen appropriate uses for solar, possibly on piers. Um, but it's certainly something for us to consider going forward, sustainable energy and um, uh, non-carbon uses. So thank you for your comment and question. Uh, I think this will be the last question. How is a wedge, how is wedge different for a developer and a public entity like a park? Um, how will wedge be effective if it is elective? So to address the last comment, how will wedge be effective if it is elective? So it is elective and, and we're not as you heard here, creating permitting regulations. I think it's up to us to do the right marketing, uh, similar to LEED, and engage the users, which we've done here on this panel, and, and engage them and make them understand what we're trying to do. Um, it is elective and it is voluntary, but I think, as you said, we're off to a good start, or what we've heard here is, um, including the government representatives, that this does have legs and, and we hope to uh, engage various users as we move along to having version 1.0 by the fall. So, Michael, can I? Michael, can I? Uh, sorry, it's me over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> can I d address the first part of that question about sure. you know? I mean, so the question was uh, how would a developer use Wedge differently than a park? And I think you know that's you know when Michael alluded to the fact that we we you know we were starting to think about these design guidelines. That's a really good question. Do you break it down by user group? Do you break it down by infrastructure type? Um, some of these things are applicable across any project. I mean, I think, if, again, speaking as a regulator, the difference between a developer and, and, and the parks department is, re is really that, you know, a developer is 
generally doing one project or maybe if it's a you know a really big developer they're doing two projects but like if you look at two trees who unfortunately couldn't be here today and their their um, project at Dumbo like imagine your two trees and and you have the Domino sugar factory and you've got all that waterfront and you're thinking what what do I do with the waterfront? And I had a very funny conversation with Judd Walentis once, and he just said, "Well, I just assumed DEC didn't want us to get anywhere near the water." So, and and, and you know, and I said, "No, no, 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 no." You know, so I think having Wedge would say, actually, we want. Uh, people to be able to get down to the water in appropriate places. We want boat tie-ups in appropriate places. We want soft edges. We want stormwater management. And I think that for a, a developer, having a, a sort of a toolkit like that is really useful. I think for the Parks Department, they're what we call at DEC our fre frequent flyers. Um, <laughs> You know, the Parks Department, the Department of Design and Construction, EDC, they're doing these things all the time. So for them, you know, I, I, th I see them more as sort of contributing towards a, uh, Wedge rather than necessarily, you know, picking up a handbook and saying, oh, I've got a park in Harlem. What should I do with the, what should I do with the edge? Really, they're pioneering those edge designs, if anything. Well put. Thank you, Venetia. I think we're going to end there. A round of applause for our panelists and respondents. Let's see, just to, uh, maybe this will be a networking opportunity.